Good afternoon. Um, I'm Celia Blake, and uh, the title of my presentation is Expert Linguistic Evidence in the Context of Caribbean English Creole Speakers' Value and Obstacles. Um, in, the, in the summer of 2010, our honoree, Hubert Devonish, uh, received a telephone call from attorneys, I think in the Public Defender's Office, right, Hubert? Um, in New York, and their client, Kwame Richardson, a Guyanese, had been charged in the US on several drug-related counts. And I think because his attorneys, yeah, I think because his attorneys, when they consulted with him, had some difficulty in understanding him, it occurred to them that probably um, Mr. Richardson might not have understood what the police were saying to him when they administered what is called the Miranda warning um, to him. And um, the Miranda warning is, um, well, it's named, it's named for a case, Miranda in Arizona, and it is really legalese in the U.S. for what the police officer recites to someone who they have taken into their custody and who they're about to interrogate. So it is some variant of the following, which I'm going to read for you, but I'm sure everybody is familiar with it because we all watch those wonderful American TV dramas. So it's, you, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to the presence of an attorney during interrogation. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. So essentially, this is designed to protect your right um, against self-incrimination, which is a constitutional right in America, and your right to have an attorney present when you're being interrogated by the police. And the law in the U.S. is that if you don't understand or appreciate this Miranda warning when the police officer administers it to you, and you say anything, you make a statement, particularly one that implicates or incriminates you, then those statements should not be admitted at the trial of the offense for which you have been charged. So if you say to your attorneys when, you know, that, you know, listen, I didn't understand or appreciate what the police officer was saying to me when he was administering this thing called a Miranda warning, then your attorney will initiate what is called a motion to suppress these pretrial statements that you made when the police interrogated you. And the idea is to ask the court to exclude those statements from, from your trial on the basis that you didn't knowingly or intelligently waive your Miranda rights. So the lawyers representing Kwame Richardson faced with a client that they, as speakers of English, were challenged to understand. They did their homework. They located an expert on Caribbean languages, of course, our Hubert Devinish, with a view to obtaining expert evidence to support their, and of course, their client's contention that Mr. Richardson could not have, in the absence of an interpreter, properly understood the Miranda warning, and thus he had not knowingly waived his right to remain silent. So um, the idea is, if that were so, if he didn't knowingly waive his right to remain silent, then those post-arrest statements that he had made to the police officer ought to be completely excluded from his trial. And uh, what happened here, of course, was that Mr. Richardson really kind of revealed a lot to the police officers when they were interrogating him. Um, the special agent who had asked him a lot of questions and he basically answered and gave them information about, you know, where the drugs came from in Ghana, et cetera, et cetera. So the lawyers um, made contact with Devinish, who takes up the challenge, and uh, that challenge was really to provide an opinion whether their client was likely to have understood the Miranda warning administered to him. And the larger question about the degree to which Mr. Richardson understood general conversational English. So Devinish, what he did was to design a test. And if you're wondering how I know all of this, of course, is that I think, Hubert, we were, I, I, you were in Barbados. And I happened to have been there. And of course, um, you know, he wanted somebody to sound off all of this on. And I just happened to be right there, right? Um, so he designed a test instrument to assist him in making the determination. And part of that test instrument was a text in which he attempted to replicate the linguistic structure and the lex lexical difficulty um, associated with the Miranda warning, um, which of course was the basis, was going to be the basis of the comprehension exercise. 
So the exercise was carried out via a telephone conversation between um, Hubert and Mr. Richardson. And of course, despite the fact that they were compatriots and the speakers of Guyanese Creole, or Creolese as they call it, Devonish's aim was to carry out the interview, was to carry out the telephone conversation entirely in English as a means of trying to establish whether Mr. Richardson, um, you know, to, to establish the degree of comprehension that he had of English. So the, the interview, having, having been conducted, carried out and conducted, he recorded it, transcribed it, and he proceeded to carry out his analysis. And one of the things I think that I, I would like to do ultimately is to see how Devonish's method compares with methods already developed for testing Arresti's understanding of the Miranda warning. Um, I'm aware that many of those tests have been developed carrying from psychology, like Thomas Grisso from psychology. But today, um, I'd like to focus on the motion to suppress uh, brought by Mr. Richardson's attorneys and to see how that panned out and the lessons language experts, particularly those who are working with um, Caribbean Creole languages, may take from that. So having carried out his analysis, Devonish found that Mr. Richardson displayed limited understanding of English. Mr. Richardson was really a speaker of a lower me selected variety of Guyanese Creole and this was consistent with this social information that Devonish had elicited from Mr. Richardson um, about his upbringing in Guyana, about his social, about his educational background. He grew up in rural Guyana, and um, I think the information was that he hadn't finished primary school either. So unsurprisingly, um, Devonish found that Mr. Richardson would have been unable to comprehend the main aspects of the Miranda warning, which had been administered to him in English without the assistance of an interpreter. I should say that his findings, Devonish's findings, compare quite favorably with studies carried out in the US with speakers of English on the comprehensibility and comprehension of the Miranda warning. In fact, one scholar who um, had looked at research, surveyed research done on this um, over the years, having reviewed that research, that literature, here is what she stated, that the researchers concluded that as used in many jurisdictions, meaning many jurisdictions, state jurisdictions in the, in the United States, much of the Miranda warning would not be properly understood by a considerable percentage of the general public and would be inadequately understood by an even larger percentage of the arrestees given their statistically lower educational attainment. Now, Mr. Richardson's attorneys had initially um, intended to have Devonish actually appear at the motion to suppress in New York as an expert witness. And um, Hubert will probably confess that given his kind of anti-colonial, kind of anti-establishmentarian, revolutionary spirit, that he was resisting the demand by the, um, well, the demand in the US um, judicial system to, to kind of dress up in a suit. So he had this battle, and I think he was prepared anyway to kind of sacrifice that spirit for the sake of Guyanese Creole, let alone poor Mr. Kwame Richardson. Anyway, as it turned out, there was a change in legal strategy, consequential, I think, up on uh, a change in the lead attorney for the team that was representing Mr. Richardson, and the decision was made not to proceed with having the expert witness at the hearing of the motion to suppress. So ultimately, eventually, the motion to suppress was brought in, the, in a US District Court of New York by the defense without the benefit of the expert testimony. And the defense, of course, essentially uh, had argued that because the defendant was not an English speaker, he did not understand the Miranda warnings, which had been told to him in English by the police, by the special agent, without the assistance of the interpreter. And uh, um, the court actually rejected the argument, and they cited a number of factors, which I've tried to outline here on this slide. The first one, that the defendant had never indicated at any time that he did not understand the warnings when, he was being when it was being administered to him, that he did not ask the special agent to repeat the warnings in English or otherwise, that the defendant had substantial English language skills that would certainly be strong enough to enable him to understand, and this evaluation was based on evidence of the interviewing special agent regarding the nature of the interview he had with the defendant, um, that the defendant did not indicate that he did not understand the questions asked of him by the special agent, and the fact that the defendant was appropriately responsive to questions put to him in English in other situations and reportedly seemed to understand another officer who spoke to him in English in their conversations. 
So the court, on the basis of these considerations, concluded that the defendant had comprehended the warnings and had thus knowingly, uh, knowingly and intelligently waived his Miranda rights in providing the statements that he had provided to the special agent. And as a result, of course, the motion to suppress was denied and the statements were admissible into evidence. Now, I want to comment a little bit on the factors, these factors that I have here on the slide that the court used to arrive at its decision. And you will notice the three of them I've highlighted there. And uh, those factors entail the defendant's neglect to state any kind of lack of understanding on, on his part or to show any sign of failure to understand, such as you know, asking somebody to repeat, etc. All right. Now, when you consider these factors in the context of what we know about Caribbean Creole language situations, you have to wonder um, how reliable these factors are as indices of comprehension. The, you know, in, in certainly in terms of the particular scenario. Um, the, the traditional overt ideology associated with Caribbean English vernaculars in their home territories, home territories is likely to make vernacular dominant speakers reluctant, particularly in the presence, I think, of authority figures, to admit any failure to understand or to provide overt signals of their lack of understanding of the superstrate language. Um, basically, an admission of your inability to understand will be tantamount to you admitting that you are kind of poor and stupid, right? Um, so given the traditional language ideology, the value of the factors concerning the defendant's failure to signal lack of understanding of the warnings as a gauge of comprehension, I think is, is problematic. The other two factors upon which the court relied involved a kind of um, a little rough and ready assessment by the court of the defendant's responses and responsiveness in certain conversations. And these were conversations, one, with the special agent who was instrumental in the defendant's arrest and who himself had administered the warning. And I won't talk about the conflict there. That's not where I'm going. Um, and secondly, with a pretrial services officer who supervised the defendant over some nine months while he was on bail. The questions in the conversation with the special agent solicited information largely concerning other persons who were involved in the, the, the incident, in the incident that grounded the offense. You know, so things like the type of drugs that were involved, the origin of the drugs in Ghana, the location to which the defendant was supposed to have delivered the drugs in the United States, etc. The, the pretrial services officer ap appeared to have testified that the defendant observed all the terms of his bail, which had been communicated to him in English and that the defendant gave appropriate responses whenever the officer met with the defendant. And the court also attached some weight to the fact that the defendant, whenever he reported on bail, successfully used these automated um, reporting kiosks, um, which generated questions in English. And these automated reporting kiosks appear to generate very kind of basic questions regarding, for example, you know, name changes, contact information, your address, the court dates, what kind of work you do, et cetera, et cetera. And some of these questions that, were, that, that are generated by this automa automated chaos system really just require a yes, no response. That's all you really need to put in. So again, how do we see these factors and how do, in, in, term, in the context of what we know about linguistics and how do they really pan out when we consider them in that, in that sociolinguistic context? We know that, car with that, that Creole continuum typologies, like the one existing in Guyana, raise issues of the range of varieties along the continuum in which a speaker is competent. There is also literature which shows that many non-native non speakers of English, though they possess social and interactional language competence, may lack proficiency in registers which incorporate more complex sentence structures and specialized lexicon, which tend to be used in connection with more abstract concepts. And the nature of the exchanges upon which the court relied to determine the defendant's language skills Seems to, seems to have required in the main interactional competence. Um, you know, where were you taking the drugs? You know, who else was along with you in this kind of thing? Um, so complete comprehension of the Miranda warning, on the other hand, calls for significantly higher English language proficiency levels given its assessed levels of reading and listening comprehension difficulty. So all I'm trying to say is that there seems to be this mismatch between the nature of the linguistic text or the discourse used by the court to assess the defendant's English language skills, proficiency, and the linguistic nature of the Miranda warning, which is the text, which is the subject matter 
of the defendant's lack of, or alleged lack of understanding. And um, Devinish's test instrument actually tried to address this by using a comprehension test, text, as I said, which tried to reproduce the linguistic structures um, present in the Miranda warning. It seems clear to me that the court's assessment method did not take into account settled notions of the, um, concerning the possibility of a gap between a speaker's interactional competence and more advanced proficiency levels demanding for, demanded for comprehension of more complex texts, and secondly, did not take into account the possibility that such proficiency, proficiency gaps loom large in speakers from Caribbean English Creole continuum situations despite the lexical similarity that we have between the English on the one hand and the Creole varieties on the other. So I'm submitting really that the court's method um, that the, that to assess the language proficiency of the defendant was quite flawed. Um, and this really highlights the, the, the value that expert linguistic evidence can bring to the judicial process. Um, but there are some legal hurdles that I'd like to just alert us to um, that must be crossed in providing expert evidence. So courts will scrutinize expert evidence to determine the reliability of such evidence. And that determination regarding reliability forms the basis for the admission of the expert evidence. Courts want to be satisfied that the opinion to be given is scientifically valid and they will engage in a number of lines of inquiry in trying to make this evaluation. Um, they will ask, for example, um, has this t technique that is used, has it been tested? Has it been subject to peer review? What is the uh, margin for error? And they want to know about the general acceptability of the technique within the relevant scientific community. So the courts are looking for some measure of scientific rigor and validity of our methods of testing. Another legal hurdle, which reared its head in this case, in the Kwame Richardson case, is that the law insists that for an expert's testimony to be admissible, and I'm quoting from case law here, um, for an expert's testimony to be admissible, it must be directed to matters within the witness's scientific, technical, or specialized knowledge, and not to lay matters which a jury is capable of understanding and deciding without the expert's help. And interestingly, in the Kwame Richardson case, the government contended that Whenever the defendant, whether the defendant understands English is an issue that the court is capable of resolving without an expert's help, and that the government was not aware of any case in the circuit in which the court permitted an expert to testify at trial or in a hearing about whether a defendant understood English. So a difficulty in a bid to offer expert linguistic evidence of the kind that Devonish was asked to provide in Richardson is this lay matter exclusionary rule. So a language expert may not even get past the starting gate because the issue may be regarded as something that is really just not the subject matter for specialist testimony. So I think the Richardson case demonstrates that there is a need to assist the judicial, the kind of judicial determination done in that case with specialist knowledge about speakers of Caribbean English Creole languages and the nature of the language situations from which these speakers hail but the case also tells us that language experts should become familiar with the legal demands and standards that are involved in the provision of expert evidence, standards and demands which must inform our testing techniques and which will also help language experts to be better prepared to address what seems to be a kind of judicial skepticism about whether language and assessment of language proficiency is appropriate um, as a subject matter for expert testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for Dr. Blake. Uh, well, we're going to have, uh, first of all, my name is Andre Bernard. I'm going to be chairing, well, the rest of this session. So we're going to start the 10-minute the question and answer segment with a question from Professor Devanish. Well, we're just really to give a, just a little bit extra. Okay. In the sense that the, um, the test was administered by me uh, speaking very slowly in as Guyanese an accent as I can get, like the one I'm talking in now. Mm -hmm. He would, of course, have been interviewed by some fast talking Yankee man at the airport. Really? But the point was that, so that's the first thing. The, first, the, uh, the entire delivery of the text was delivered 
went on in this particular kind of way, a kind of way I don't even talk in Jamaica because you people don't understand when I talk this way. But that's another story, right? So, one. Secondly, the part of what had to happen was that you, I had to be sufficiently aware that you could be playing the fool. You could be playing stupid, you understand? So, they um, had to be um, set up such that he would not really, or I have to be looking for the kinds of signs that, um, that you know, he might, might actually be deceptive. What was interesting is that at a certain point, when I'm speaking to him, a lady come, because he's married to a lady in the United States, a Guyanese who is, and so on. And um, she, at various points, is coming and saying, he asking you, blah, 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 blah. Right? So, so what's happening is that um, there's anxiety on his part to get it right. Everybody they, uh, wants him to answer so he can look intelligent, right? Whereas, of course, actually, the defense is that he really supposed to not know what's going on. But the whole um, scenario is one in which they are trying to, to, she was trying to make sure that he looks as intelligent as possible, and uh, therefore is sometimes coming in in the background and saying, he asks me so, 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 right? They, um, they, it was interesting that they, well, the, 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 te the test itself was something I just from memory. You know, the, the thing says that you have a, a right to remain silent and something, something so, right? And so it, was, it created a different scenario with uh, a bank account. And that, um, that you have, it, where, where instead of saying you have a right, but you, uh, I find another phrase, huh? You're, yeah, you're entitled. To, um, um, to, to do something with this bank account, and, um, and if you don't get so-and-so, then you're supposed to do something else. So you create an exact scenario in terms of these conditional clauses and so on and so forth. And um, what turned out to be the case is that he didn't have a clue what was going on. Um, the, that he said that when I asked him how he go to uh, America, he said he go with a man, a blind man. He said, huh? Yeah, he said, um, he, said he go, I go for lead a blind man in a race, right? So eventually, after a couple of follow-up questions, I realized that he is the, 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 the blind man. At, at, he had befriended the blind man, and they used to run marathons. And he, he now is the front man, the blind man in the race in America. After he go to he stay, right? And he meet this woman, and he married the woman, and thing, and so on. So that's a kind of a very a naive kind of worldview system. It's both linguistic and very, very, very limited in, um, in his worldview. It's sort of, it was difficult for me to not conclude that he would not have a clue what then people were asking him about. And it's therefore interesting that um, the comment, uh, the research that, that, uh, and the follow-up to suggest that they throw it out. Just quickly to say that the point that you are making is that, say, a test like that, what we should do is run it. That do it on lots and lots of people. Try it out with Jamaicans. Get, Thing and create a corpus that says if this thing here can work and it's a good proxy for the Miranda warning and if people don't pass it, it means they don't understand. And then once we have that as a, a body of established research here and it requires collaboration and cooperation across every Caribbean country, yeah. right? We can create a, a, a body of material that then establishes whether people understand or not. Yeah, the, the, the U.S. rules on expert evidence and its admissibility might be a little bit stricter than in other jurisdictions around the world. Um, so in some jurisdictions, for example, you, they don't necessarily insist on the scientific validity of it so much for admissibility, which is what happens in the U.S., but they, it will go to weight. So they may say, yes, you can, you, you can have an expert witness on this, but then it will go to, well, how much weight, how much value are we to ascribe to that evidence? And sometimes judges are so scathing, they will just say that evidence is just no good and they're not considering it. So it, it, but in the US, because of, of, of the case law and what the law is there, apparently a kind of um, assessment is done prior to the admission, the admission of the evidence to figure out, well, is this really reliable? How scientifically valid is it is? Yeah, Celia, this is just a comment. Um, this, this, this issue doesn't apply just to um, Creole speakers. I know there are a couple of petitions, for example, in front of the Inter-American um, Commission of Human Rights 
I know one is from El Sa a man from El Salvador who also said in his interrogation and thing in the police, they gave him a Spanish speaker, but I'm assuming because he's maybe rural El Salvador, or whatever, he also claims in his petition that he didn't really understand what was going on either. And the, um, the, the state providing him with a bilingual, what they called a bilingual, he, he said he didn't even know where this Spanish speaker came from. He didn't sound like he came from El Salvador. Um, and so he's claiming that, yeah, he didn't know what was going on either. It's, it's interesting because it doesn't just arise where the languages are different. I mean, the issue with the Miranda is that it's so complex and the, 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 the kind of cognitive level that you must have attained to have understood that the, the text and the nature of that text that it causes problems for people who are speakers of English, and that's really the majority of the research. A lot of the research has been carried out in relation to speakers of English in the United States, yes. Okay, so Celia, I really enjoyed this presentation, and I'd like to ask, do you think that the, the fact that the, the court was a bit resistant to having uh, an expert witness might have been due to the fact that it was, or it is possible, for a, a, a defendant to feign ignorance. Because in, in, my own, in my own experience, I found that it was fairly easy because um, w when I did expert testimony witness in, in Toronto, it was fairly easy to get a, a fairly good reception from the judge and from the jury because um, it is the jury now that couldn't understand what was uh, going on. It's, it's, it's the jury that was worried that they wouldn't be able to understand the text. So do you think that it might have been different if the judge was a person who needed to understand it, the witness's yeah. testimony, yeah. that I mean, they might I'm, have been a little bit more yeah, receptive and, to yeah. have Devonish's And input. in all fairness to, to the judge, it wasn't the judge who um, you know, ruled that the, the evidence couldn't come in. It was just that Mr. Richardson had a change of, of attorneys, and they just didn't follow on the course of the, the prior team. Um, so the judge actually mentioned in the memorandum and order, he says, well, he doesn't know exactly what happened. He was supposed to have invited an expert or have expert testimony, and he did. He just states as a fact. And so it's left to the judge to make the determination. But uh, of course, I guess people can, can, can feign, but you're perfectly right, because I think, as I have actually spoken to one, not, not, not the attorney, but a, a paralegal who was actually working on this team, um, thanks to my time at Stanford. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, made it very, very clear. In fact, I actually emailed one of the attorneys and he made it very clear to me that they couldn't understand Mr. Richardson, which is how the issue of, well, maybe we should bring a motion to suppress, came up, all right, because of their failure to, to understand him and what he was saying. So it must have, it occurred to them that, look here, maybe he just didn't understand what's going on with the Miranda. And here we have a legal, um, you know, something to hang, you know, a, a legal claim on. So we can do that and try and get this evidence excluded um, if we're successful. Um, but, but yes, but I just think that people need to bring much more, they need to be much more aware of these kind of linguistic issues like, you know, that you can actually understand if somebody says, well, what's your name and where are you going? But you really might not be able to make out, you know, what it means if they use more complex sentences. Yeah. Um, I just want to piggyback on Hubert's quick comment about the local situations because in the region, if you don't put the things right in the region, you're going to have problems all over the place. I know that in St. Lucia, those rights are read to Pato speakers in English. They're then told in Pato that if they don't, if they say anything, the diff different variations of it, they will tell the magistrate and the magistrate will, will convict them. That's one version of it. All right? There are several versions, depending on which policeman you meet. And therefore, um, what happens in those cases is that people can't have any sense of confidence in the, in the way in which the system operates. The only people who don't have official translators for them in the courts are the Pato speakers. If you're Spanish or French or German, you'll have an official um, translator, interpreter. But if you are Lucian Patwa speaker, can't eat your dinner. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. I was going to say something similar to what he had said about the fact that I think that the problem is that 
persons outside the Creole community are not taking Creole seriously and they're not understanding it as a valid language. And I'm, my question is, what do you think would be the first step to take for us to take it on as a region? Because the Creole situation and the, the different versions of Creole and understanding within them is a problem that we're all facing within the region. So what would be the first step to take for us to tackle that issue as a region? Yeah, well, boy, that's, that's a very major question. But, but I think, um, and springboarding from, from Hubert's presentation yesterday, I think one of the things we need to, 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 to try to get done is, even if we don't do it at the level of kind of official dumb in terms of a law, but to actually to sensitize our justice system about this kind of problem. And, and I'm thinking that this probably isn't hard to do because they are working in the system and they understand some of these difficulties that we're talking about. But to, 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 to try and, 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 and have the, the, ju the justice system adopt some kind of bilingual approach um, for the system, institutionally, not just people saying, okay, fine, this man isn't ha is having a problem understanding me, let me do a little code switching and see what happens. To, to really take this thing seriously, because it's not just, as I said you know, yesterday, it's not just about language and our interest in language, it's now about people's human rights. And so I think that for us to get um, an institutional um, uh, approach in the justice system, um, which would uh, have regard to the fact that here is what the language situation is. There are some difficulties. Those difficulties have implications for fairness and justice and the administration of justice. And uh, to take it from there, yeah? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Blake. Thank you for the questions. We're moving right along to our next presenter, who is Dr. Alison Irvin Sobers. Her research interests lie in the areas of sociolinguistics and human rights research. She completed her PhD in 2006 uh, under the supervision of Professor Hubert Devonish, and that was about standard Jamaican English and language ideology. She is now conducting part-time research for Jamaicans seeking asylum in the UK, and she teaches at the UWI Open Campus. Her presentation is entitled, An Obligation to Redress, Language Rights, Linguistic Discrimination, and the Inter-American Human Rights System. Please make her welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I start, can I just say um, how pleased I am to be here to celebrate um, Hubert, um, because Hubert taught me 1980-81 in the Jurassic era when there, were no, there was no semester system or anything like that. And it was, I think it was nine of us in the L230 class. So I'm very pleased to be here. I mean, you is actually home for me. So my topic this afternoon is language rights, language discrimination um, in the inter-American human rights system. More specifically, what I want to discuss are the cases, the actual litigation that comes in front of the Inter-American Court that has, to do, that has anything to do with language rights or language discrimination. To be clear, there's nothing in any of the human rights instruments that govern this hemisphere that says anything about language rights. There is a general prohibition on discrimination and sometimes language is allowed to be ahead of that um, prohibition, but there's nothing specific in any of the human rights instruments. However, every now and then cases come in front of the Inter-American Court that clearly impact, um, and, and these are typically indigenous peoples or maroon peoples, and therefore their language rights come up and when we examine these cases, we can start to see some of the thinking of the judges of the Inter-American Court in terms of issues of language rights. So that those, there are three cases I brought today to discuss. Um, there's a, it's a database of about 220 judgments which I've started to work through, and I have identified so far eight 
that deal with language rights or have the judgment has said something about language rights. And I've brought three of those cases today. But before I get into that, let me give some context to the discussion. So um, for those who don't know, there are 35 member states of the Organization of American States. All the independent countries in this hemisphere are members of the OAS. And those 35 countries have different kinds of constitutional arrangements for language status and language functions uh, within, their, within the borders. So um, let, me, let me just kind of give you a general idea of the type of constitutional arrangements you have. Um, the, the biggest distinction, the big broad distinction is between those states that have a specific constitutional provision that says so-and-so is the official language of the country and those states that don't say anything about language at all in their constitutions. Um, to a general extent, it is the Spanish-speaking countries that have a specified official language. Um, Haiti has, a specified, has specified official languages. Um, um, Canada has specified official languages. But mostly, it is the Spanish-speaking countries that have done so. Um, the English-speaking countries, which is the other big group in the OAS, typically say nothing about language at all in their constitutions. And as I will come later, there are one or two constitutions that are actually explicitly discriminatory in the um, Caribbean constitutions. So um, the constitutions, we can say, run through three phases or three historical phases. And those phases are available to us now in the, the types of arrangements that still happen. So phase one um, is, where, is where the only thing that was recognized was the colonial language. So there are constitutions that only recognize Spanish or only recognize English or French. Um, Honduras is a good example. Honduras's constitution says that the official language of the country is Spanish and it is the duty of the state to protect its purity and to increase its use. Um, that's what the Constitution says. It says nothing about any other indigenous languages or anything like that. So Caribbean um, territories typically too have those kinds of arrangements where um, even though there's no explicit official language, there are other constitutional provisions that tell you the only language that matters is English. The second phase of um, constitutions is somewhere in the 1980s, where there is a now recognition, um, what Colin Rios calls a norm and accommodation model. So you recognize that there is Spanish as the norm, that's the, of the state, but you're now going to accommodate indigenous languages. So you have phrasing like, um, indigenous languages are the patrony, patrimony or the heritage of the state, and it is the duty of the state to preserve the culture of our patrimony. Phrases like that, that are largely symbolic, because there's nothing in any of the constitutions that says anything about implementation or education or, any, or, or anything that would suggest that they're doing more than as I said, making symbolic gestures to accommodating indigenous languages. And then the final set of, a, 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 a constitution like that, El Salvador. Constitutions like El Salvador, Guatemala, um, Argentina has that kind of constitution. And then the final type of constitution now gives official status to indigenous languages. So um, exemplified, for example, like Bolivia, Bolivia recognizes the constitution says Spanish is the official language of the state of Bolivia and it lists specifically 30 other indigenous languages that are also if official in the state of Bolivia. And those 30 official languages, it specifies in the constitution that anywhere you go in Bolivia, you can use Spanish. And if you live in a region where X language dominates, then that language is also supposed to be used in the institutions of that region. So there, Venezuela is another constitution where it specifies the language of the state is Venezuela, Venezuela, sorry, and Venezuela's wording is a little different. The language of the state is Spanish, and the indigenous languages are official for the indigenous peoples. 
which is slightly different than saying that the indigenous languages are official. And there's a suggestion that that is also a largely symbolic arrangement too. So that's the kind of constitutional arrangements you have at the Spanish side. In the, um, English-speaking Caribbean, no, that's where you have the only examples of explicitly discriminatory provisions in the Constitution. This is from the Constitution of St. Lucia, and the Constitution of St. Lucia, to, to build on what was said, um, somebody's mentioned St. Lucia in the core system, to build on what was said about the, in St. Lucia, you cannot be a member of the Senate if you can't speak English. Um, therefore, if you, which is explicitly discriminatory, particularly in a state where um, many of the people in that state are Quayle speakers, those kinds of arrangements, that kind of discrimination is um, in the Constitution of Guyana, it's in the Constitution of Antigua, it's in the, it's in the Constitution of St. Kitts, I think. There are a number of Eastern Caribbean states that are very, Dominica, that are very clear, you cannot be in the legislature if you don't speak English um, to a certain proficiency. That, that's the clause that most of them have replicated. Um, so that's the, that's the context, the typology of um, language situations you have in the, in the region. Um, so briefly, let me just tell you about the inter-American system. Um, for the purposes of this talk, what matters is the American Convention on Human Rights. Now that was signed in 1969, and that, um, that American Convention set up the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And what we are interested in here is that Inter-American Court. Most of the states in the OAS do not as ascribe to the jurisdiction of the court. So most states have decided to ignore the inter-American court. And again, typically those are the Anglo states. All the Spanish-speaking states do, um, if the court makes a judgment, they have agreed to abide by the rulings of the court. Added to the Spanish-speaking states are Suriname and Barbados. Those are the only Caribbean states that have, that will, um, that have agreed to come under the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. So, to the cases that I have brought. Okay. Um, the first case I want to discuss is the right to a juridical personality. Now, this is the case of the Saramaka versus Suriname. And uh, Mr. Edwards and Mr. Jabini, these are the two gentlemen who led the delegation to the Inter-American Commission, and they insisted on making their presentation in Saramacan, even though Mr. Edwards, um, he can speak English. Now, the case with the Saramacan um, has to do with, should indigenous people, should um, Maroon peoples be treated in the same way as indigenous peoples? Thank you. And the Saramacan came with some specific arguments. One, they have lived in this territory for the last 300 years. Two, they have a historical claim to this territory. Three, um, they require control over this territory for their livelihood. So they went into a long description of what the hunting and the, the, the resources that they use on this territory. And they ended their presentation with, we want to live as free people in Suriname. And what they were asking the Inter-American court to do was to recognize them in the same way that they recognize indigenous peoples. So what they wanted was a juridical personality. And the Inter-American court agreed that the Saramacan form a group and that, that any interaction the state of Suriname has to have with the Saramaca has to be as a collective, not as individual property rights and you have to negotiate with the collective if you want to do anything with Saramaka territory. And therefore, that right to a juridical personality means that the Saramaka as a people become a legal entity that the state of Suriname has to recognize. This was a landmark decision in the hemisphere because up till then, Maroon peoples were not 
treated as, in, like, as indigenous peoples. So now Maroon peoples are, in, at least in this hemisphere, and according to the judgment of the court, Maroon peoples are treated as indigenous peoples with collective ancestral rights that the state is bound to honor. The interesting thing from a linguistic language rights point of view is that the court required the judgment to be rendered in Saramacan to the Saramacan people. The court required um, that radio programs in Saramacan um, have to be broadcast to the Saramacan people so that there will be maximum understanding of the judgment. This, I, this was interesting for me because this is not, it was not always the requirement of many of the judgments I looked at. Um, there was one judgment rendered for the Njuka where the court required the judgment to be given in Surinamese. I'm not sure what Surinamese meant, but I infer that it meant Sranan, I'm assuming, because it was required in Dutch and Surinamese. Um, so the court doesn't always um, require states to render judgments in, in, the, in the native um, tongue of minority peoples. And I, I would like to think part of it is because the Saramaka themselves said to the Inter-American Commission, this is our language, this is, we are going to present ourselves in our language and therefore kind of force you to recognize us in our language. So that was the first case. Second case um, has to do with the Garifuna. And this is Mr. Lopez Alvarez. Mr. Lopez Alvarez lives on the Caribbean coast of Honduras. He is the head of two or three NGOs that deal with the territorial rights. Again, the common thread in all of these cases is the state would like to develop land that is owned, that owned by the Saramaca or the Garifuna or whatever. So Mr. Lopez Alvarez is the head of this group in an area of Honduras called Taylor, which luckily for him and his people is right there on the Caribbean coast with beachfront. And the state of Honduras has realized that this is prime real estate for tourism development and for the retirement industry that is now big business in Honduras. Mr. Lopez Alvarez is, of course, a fly in the ointment. Mr. Lopez Alvarez is scraped up and charged with trafficking in crack cocaine. Um, from my point of view, the issue that interests me in terms of language rights is that Mr. Lopez Alvarez is severely beaten in prison. He was in prison all told for seven years. He's severely beaten in prison because the prison has decided that Garifuna is not to be spoken he can, Garifuna is not to be spoken among themselves. Garifuna is not to be spoken with visitors. Garifuna is banned from the prison compound. Thank you. And therefore, um, Mr. Lopez Alvarez is beaten several times when prison authorities hear him speaking his language. The argument from the prison authorities is that this is a national security issue and um, therefore the safest thing to do is to force prisoners to speak in Spanish so that the prison authorities can understand what is going on. It makes no sense, but that's, that's the argument from the, from the prison authorities. Um, in fact, one of the judges of the court even quipped that um, you know, Garifuna is a, a, a language variety that these people have been speaking to each other for, for generations. It's not something they made up to mess with the prison guards. Um, the upshot of the judgment of the Inter-American Court was that, yes, Honduras had violated clearly the language rights, the dis was, had discriminated against Mr. Lopez Alvarez, had discriminated against the Garifuna, um, Mr. 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 Alvarez's representatives asked the court to require the state of Honduras to allow Garifuna in all criminal justice procedures in that region. Unfortunately, the court sidestepped the issue and instead went with the uh, requirement that the state of Honduras give prison guards human rights training so that they'd be more sensitive to the needs of 
um, African and indigenous populations in the prison system. Um, so let me wrap up and, 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 and address that, because what I have found when I've looking, been looking at these judgments is that on the one hand, the Inter-American Court has tried to expand the rights of indigenous and maroon peoples in terms of things like property and autonomy and self-government. On the other hand, the court, since it doesn't have a notion of language rights, I have interviewed about 12 or 15 members of staff at the Inter-American Commission, and only two of them had ever heard of the, the, a concept called language rights. Um, there are no members of staff who are indigenous speakers or come from indigenous community. I think there's one guy who say he kind of know a few words of Guarani. So there's no, no member of staff that comes from that community that is so affected. And I think that part of the reason why there's no language rights when it was discussed was seen as something that was nice, but it was not something that was necessary for, for real human rights like freedom of expression or um, political participation and so on. And if we return to the, to the issue of St. Lucia, again, the, the inter-American system allows states to regulate things like political participation on the grounds of age and language and stuff like that. So, so there is that deference to the state, but at the same time, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an attempt to expand rights. The complicating factor, of course, is that, that when you look at the data, um, World Bank data for 2016, for example, suggests that about 50% of indigenous and maroon peoples now live in urban spaces. So these rulings that carve out territory for indigenous groups are carving out territory for smaller and smaller groups of people in the face of a state that is arguing that national development requires me to mine ex or log hair or develop hair for tourism. And if I can have national development, then I lift everybody in the, in the, in the state, whereas you are carving out territory for smaller and smaller groups of people um, that is valuable territory to the state. Because the inter-American system operates on consensus, you have to get all 35 of these countries to agree to some of these um, human rights con um, conditions. And therefore, it becomes more and more difficult, um, as I said, for these states to come to some kind of consensus about, or rather, it's going to become more and more complicated for states to come to this some kind of consensus about indigenous or um, maroon people's rights. Um, I good? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alison. That was very, very interesting for me. Um, and just two quick comments. Um, one is thanks for um, raising, because what happens here is that the language rights. Um, I don't want to call it a movement, but the whole, you know, we justify language rights in Jamaica on the basis of, um, you know, well, people are excluded from certain processes of the state, et cetera, yeah? And so there's this kind of justification that appeals to rationality. Um, oh, we can't afford to exclude all of these people from the state. These people have a right to be involved in the state processes, et cetera. What the, the Suriname case raised for me was language rights above that on the level of preference that if I come to a court, I should, even though I know English, even though I know whatever the state language is, and I am fluent in another language, or I self-identify with that yes. language, I should be able to, to, to operate in it. But yeah? it also sends a message to the court that yes. you're going to have to deal with me on my terms. Yeah. This is, yeah. yeah, but we have a little way to go to make that jump here between just sheer rationality of not excluding as opposed to self-identity right. and, and uh, asserting one's language rights because this is the language you feel comfortable in or that you want to speak today. Right? Right. The other thing is um, just the, the, a comment on the um, situation that you identified in the solution constitution um, and that I'm just wanting to say that that exists in, maybe not constitutionally but certainly in Jamaica where the standing orders for our Senate and indeed for our lower house. Um, there's a provision in there that says the language of the Senate is English and people need to communicate in English. 
And if we ever thought that that was just a dead letter, we, everybody in Jamaica who is sitting in the audience will know a few years ago that a, 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 a member of the Senate, as he then was at the time, he's now in the law house, um, you attempted to speak Creole. And I mean, it was just, you know, it's an apology for what Creole right. is. I think he was just trying to say respect you or something. I mean, I don't know how many people would have said that he's Creole, but anyway. I remember, <laughs> yeah, I remember. And, and he was, was just asked for this by the president of the Senate, right? Yeah. So even when it's not in there constitutionally, you can get these rules which operate in this kind of way to exclude, um, you know, a, a vernacular language like Jamaican or, or Creole in St. Lucia. Um, you right. know, from, from, from operating in these institutions. Right. And the, 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 the thing with a system like the Inter-American Commission, it's a petition system. The person who is discriminated against has to petition for redress. Um, so the Saramaka petition for redress. Um, uh, given some of the reaction I got when I brought this issue up with, about St. Lucia, um, I can probably guess that it's very unlikely that any petitioner is going to come up from St. Lucia arguing that their language rights are being violated um, and in this discrimination. Give, and this is a question of identity and how you see yourself. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in a smaller community in Port Morris, St. Catherine, um, I grew up around a lot of monolingual uh, Jamaican Creole speakers who ironically had very negative opinions of the language but still continue to use it every day. Uh, my question kind of twofold, um, if it's a case where it is that we do get policy, mem policy makers to look more favorably on Jamaican Creole, do you think that will cause regular everyday users of Jamaican Creole to then in turn look on their language a little bit more favorably? And if not, what exactly can we do, especially for me who still lives in that community, to influence some change for us to look at the language itself? Uh, a little more in a positive light. Language attitudes can be complicated because it, they're tied up with things like who is, who is doing the speaking, what are the, what are the social benefits of this variety. Um, so one of the ways of changing attitudes, though, is yes, if the state says that this language is ours and this language is valuable for us and that we have this, 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 this is our official language, the official languages of Jamaica are Jamaican and English, things like that, that would, I think, don't you, go some way to changing or to influencing people's attitudes to the language? Certainly, certainly, if you had a constitution that said that, then you could um, litigate your own discrimination. And you could say to the state that since this is the official language, um, I require it in institutions and, so, and the court and education and so forth because most people speak this. But there was, was a, a, there was a time, time when English was the language, language of course, too, wasn't there? And the attitudes changed. Okay, so uh, thanks for that presentation, Alison. So, um, so is there a way that you think cases or personalities like Mr. Lopez and the case that you mentioned before could be put on the forefront? Because uh, whenever a person hears language rights, it's a Hubert Devenish and a Carolyn Cooper who are normally at the forefront and a kind of hostility has been, you know, built up against any kind of doctor, this professor, this PhD, this, talking about language rights and human rights. For instance, so the, it, human rights, based on the comments that I'm seeing in the newspapers, the articles that Professor Cooper and Professor Devanish have written, is seen as an imposition that the elites and the foreigners are trying to impose on the same people it is designed to protect. So is there a way that the Mr. Alvarez could be at the forefront? Yeah, the, 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 this is my opinion now, okay? My personal opinion about this. The Jamaican language situation, I have, we have all watched for over seven, almost a, a century, um, trying to do a top-down um, change about, about the language situation in Jamaica. 
like Mr. Lopez Alvarez, like um, Mr. Edwards, if the people who are discriminated against linguistically in Jamaica or St. Lucia are not the ones who are going to agitate for change, I'm not sure if top down is ever going to actually um, get change done. So if if the people if 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 that if the vast majority of Jamaicans who know, for example, that my kid is going to school and 80% of the, the, the people coming out of the school system not really getting anything from it, and part of that is a linguistic issue, and my kids are the ones who are, are suffering from it. Now, if you don't recognize you're being discriminated against and agitate for change, um, I'm not sure if top-down is... These are all people who agitated for their own rights. Clive kind of upstaged me a while ago. Um, so I have to wheel and come again. The um, South Africa, any kind of lessons that we might get from that context where they have 11 official languages um, since democracy in 1994, um, and how might we learn from that context for what's happening in this part of the world? Um, in, in lessons in terms of what? You think having, you mean having like, making all of these languages official. If you take like the case of Bolivia, okay, um, what, I, what, as what I understand from what I can see on the contemporary situation in Bolivia, even though all of these languages have been made official, um, it has not really arrested the issues that we know of language shift and all of that, of people moving into urban spaces and Spanish being the language that, they, that, that dominates. Um, so, I don't know, it, that, it, it, that one is difficult. With 30 official languages, I see what, what, what um, Bolivia is doing, um, but I'm not sure either again on the ground if that changes, as I said. Um, just, just as a last comment, I mean, it is one thing, it is one thing at least two judges of the Inter-American Court have recognized because they have explicitly said it's the duty of the state to protect people like the Saramaka or the Kuna or the Njuka because in the absence of that protection, they will lose their language. So the Inter-American Court is aware of that as an issue too. We'll, we'll talk afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you so much. Our, our final presenter for this session is Dr. Cadian Walters, who is a lecturer of linguistics here at the UWI Mona campus. Her research interests include linguistic discrimination, language rights, forensic linguistics, and language ideology. She also lectures in the junior command course and has developed and taught courses in the high potential detective training program at the National Police College. She is the 2017 recipient of the Faculty of Humanities and Education Dean's Award for Excellence in PhD Research. Please make her welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Una, all right? Yeah. Una, tired? Yeah. <laughs> yes, kind of tired, but it's worth it, right? All right. <laughs> So today we'll be looking at linguistic discrimination, hypercorrection, linguistic insecurity, and other linguistic coping strategies or mechanisms. I think the title is different from what you have in your, um, your booklet. So just a little bit quickly about the journey to studying linguistic discrimination. I remember in in my first, what was it, probably the first month of postgrad, I wrote up a nice proposal. I had a wonderful proposal on language awareness because I felt the people needed to know what's happening in terms of the writing system that we have and that Jamaican Creole is indeed a language. And so I was very excited and I went to Prof with my wonderful proposal and Prof was like, mm hmm so what? You tell them about Jamaican Creole language awareness, and then what? 
So he was like, yes, it is well thought out. It, it, it seems thorough, but how about linguistic discrimination? And I actually fell in love with, with linguistics really in my final year in language planning with Rocky when we started to look at language rights. And so, you know, when Prof said, what about linguistic discrimination? It, it connects, you know, with language awareness and so on and so forth. I was like, okay. But Prof secretly had his agenda, you know. Yeah? In terms of linguistic discrimination and where he wanted to go with the research and all of that. But it was an easy sell. And so we are here today looking a little bit more at linguistic discrimination. So thank you, Prof. The picture, the picture on the right is actually my very first um, international presentation in Dominica. And it was so bad, Prof was like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the other one is the um, PhD defense, where he looks a little, well, you can see that he's smiling in that one, right? Thank God. So let us move on now. So we're going to be looking at language use in our media and a little bit about the standard language ideology that exists. Then we're going to go through linguistic discrimination, just a little bit of my study, and then we look at what it is that dominant Patwa speakers, monolingual Patwa speakers are doing when engaging with the media. So we know that we have two dominant languages. We have Jamaican Creole and we have English. And English is usually used to discuss those very serious topics, no so? Wanna talk to me now? <laughs> right, so it's usually used to discuss the very serious issues. While Jamaican Creole, we may see it being used to adver advertise particular products, right? So the mackerel, yeah, and the, what's that? The, yeah, the poor people food, um, patty, uh, no, yeah, you know, burger is in English, you know, but patty, you know, patois. <laughs> yes, right? And so we see that kind of uh, dynamic in terms of what the media houses do with the languages. And they're actually just reflecting the attitudes. They're reflecting the ideologies that actually exist. So Devonish says that the people speak one language, which is Jamaican, while the authoritative voice reporting on what these people have done, what they are doing, or are saying is always in English, right? So I don't know if you remember the program under the law. Anybody remembers that program? So you have a little dialogue, and the neighbor must have chopped down the neighbor tree or something, and they talk in Patois. And then, so the dialogue, the scenario is in Patwa, and then the man comes and he says, um, that's how it is under the law. And all the explanation is done in English, right? So the explanation of the law, the legal ramifications and all of that is usually done in English, right? Well, the law is in English, but what's the purpose of the program, right? <laughs> so... As is typically the case with mixed language government advertisements and public service announcements, any dialogue between the characters takes place in Jamaican Creole and the official information which, which refutes or corrects the beliefs of the characters is usually shared in English. Right. Okay, so we did a language use in the media survey in 2016, I believe. That was the, we, it was the language planning class and the Jamaican language unit. And some of the questions we asked include, do you think Patwa speakers fully understand the news when it is read in English? Do you think news readers should read the news in Patwa so that the Patwa speakers can understand? And do you think that the JIS magazine program should be done in Patwa so that the Patwa speakers can understand what the Jamaican government is communicating? And in all of these questions, most of the, the informants that we surveyed said yes. 
they believe that Jamaican sh Creole should be used in the media for the news, for the GIS, and for all of those other very important programs. All right, so there is a place for that. And of course, we should know about the Broadcast Jamaican program, which is on, still on, Newstalk 93FM, where the news is read entirely in Jamaican Creole at 12 and at 5. So that is really the pioneer uh, program because it shows us, it demonstrates that Jamaican Creole can actually be used to discuss any topic because what they're doing is they're translating the news headlines from English to Jamaican and they're reading it and people are appreciating it even in that survey people expressed, the informants expressed an appreciation for that news. So if you don't have the app yet, you can download it. All right, so because of, because of the dynamics now with Jamaican Creole and English, we have what has emerged as a standard language ideology. And Lippy Green defines the standard language ideology as a bias towards an abstracted, idealized, homogeneous, spoken language which is imposed from above and which takes written language as its model. So that imposition from above, from the government too, right? And we've tried to, to interact with these stakeholders for several years, but um, I think we're making some headway, I would say. So the standard language ideology exists. Rick Fudd says, in terms of the standard view of language attitudes, that the standard view the standard view of language attitudes in a Creole continuum is that the standard variety is seen as good. It is the prestigious variety. So even in my classes when we're discussing uh, certain topics, you would hear the students say, oh, speaking properly, you know, when making reference to speaking English, right? And it says the non-standard varieties, including the mesolectal and the basolectal varieties, which are often referred to collectively as Creole, are bad. So English is good, the Creole is bad. That is the standard view of language attitudes, not just in Jamaica, but elsewhere where Creole languages are spoken. Now, as a result of this standard language ideology, we have now discriminatory practices towards the speakers who speak the bad variety, which is the Creole, all right? And so we say that linguistic discrimination really refers to treating someone differently and unfairly because of his or her native language or other characteristics of their speech. And Professor John Ball, he, mentions linguistic profiling in North America that looks at a discriminatory reaction to a telephone call. So the linguistic profiling is similar to racial profiling where the voice indicates the race, right? So it results from a discriminatory reaction to a phone call. And of course, this type of discrimination is interpersonal where you're interacting, oh Lord, where you're interacting, thank you, with another individual and it is discriminatory. Now the indirect form of linguistic discrimination is when you provide information to the public in just one language, whereas the public speaks several other languages, right? So that is indirect linguistic discrimination. So the provision of services by the state, the provision of information by the state in English is indirect linguistic discrimination against our Patwa speakers. And the Linton, Philp, and French study that was done in 2001 and mentioned by Devanish in his proposal read the Charter of Rights, actually looked at linguistic discrimination in six 
financial institutions and found that four out of the six times the service representative was actually directly rude. They were indifferent when the researcher spoke in Jamaican as opposed to when they spoke in English. So the same researcher going to service representatives requesting information on how to open an account. They're treated in, let's say, an impolite manner, yes, and when compared to how they were treated in English, realized that that was indeed direct linguistic discrimination. So I'm gonna quickly go through. All right, so for my study, we telephoned, uh, we telephoned service public agencies, 16 of them, and we had a male and female caller, and we, we telephoned these service representatives on different occasions, using Jamaican Creole on one occasion, using English on another. And we found that for the bar case, we had outcomes-based linguistic discrimination, which really has to do with whether or not service was granted or denied. So we're looking at the end of the interaction. And for the Jamaican situation, it was really a procedural-based discrimination where during the interaction, they were treated unfairly and differently. So even though they got the information that they requested, they were treated differently and unfairly. So let me quickly go now to hypercorrection. So because of linguistic discrimination, as a monolingual patois speaker, you want to hypercorrect and you tend to develop certain linguistic coping strategies, okay? And so linguistic insecurity may be seen as a negative self-image of a speaker regarding his or her own speech variety or language. And so based on what you tell me about my language, I begin to develop this insecurity towards it. And when I have to use it, I develop some, let me skip that. I develop some linguistic coping strategies, right? So I can maneuver and portray or pretend that I know the prestigious form, right? And in doing so, you laugh at me because it doesn't quite come out how you expect or how it ought to be, right? And so we have these different uh, situations. Now, I'm still feeling it out, right? Still feeling it out. But in terms of changing the morphology, the phonology, the twanging that you, you know about, so the pseudo-American accent, right? Developing a new register altogether. So your idiolect is very different. And we're going to look at some examples of what monolingual patois speakers have been doing over time to cope and to maneuver in this space where we have the standard language ideology that says English is better than your own language. All right, so we should remember from the, the Tivoli inquiry, not the Tivoli inquiry, the Tivoli incursion, right, when they went into the community and they started to interview um, some of the victims and the witnesses and so on and so forth. So let me quickly play some of what was said for you. here we hear the, the famous the people them are dead in right 
and that is really the, the applying rules, applying English rules that she knows to her native language, her mother tongue, which is Jamaican Creole. Not only that, but in terms of developing new words. So there is morphological hypercorrection to, in terms of befront. So that's before, plus, in front of, right? Or in front. So that's befront. So let me go to the next one. So these are some of the coping, make this coping strategies that monolingual or dominant patois speakers apply when interacting in this particular space. Everyone should know um, Clifton or Cliff Twang, as some of you call him. And um, he actually, so he's one of the examples where he developed a totally new register for himself, right? Based on his feet, he developed this, this, this different register which led to a different kind of ideology. I don't have time to play the clip, but we know everybody, no, um, nobody can across it, right? Yeah. Right, and, it, and he uses, so he changes the, the, the O's and the A's, or he emphasizes, so he says cross, yeah? Right. And um, it was so funny to, to so many people that, you know, he, it, it, it seemed as if he wasn't even aware of what was going on. That was just how he talked. And that was just his speech for him, especially in this kind of domain in the media, right? But we find it funny. However, imagine now the emotional distress that these dominant patois speakers experience when they get this kind of reaction. So it's funny to us because we have the luxury of being bilingual, right? But it's not so for them. Here is another one, quickly. So listen carefully. adopting this, kind, this different kind of register like he was a, a, a news reader because he was using words like it occurred and it flipped three times and so on and so forth. So he was making that attempt based on what he was accustomed to because he knows that it is not okay for taco, you normally talk when you on TV, right? And so he does that kind of uh, coping strategy no, and develop some kind of, the, the register sounds similar, as I said before, to a newscaster. And for the young lady, midway, we noticed that she used some kind of, as I call it, a pseudo-American accent, right? So over there, right? because again, I'm on TV, and so I have to apply these kinds of strategies. And at the end also, there was, there was an incorrect, um, I think, conjugation, but she said, and she dies, or something she of the died. sort, and she's, she's died. died. She's died. She's, she's died. died. Right. And so they feel as though they're not trying to be funny. Yes. They're actually trying to, to assimilate, to the, they're trying to use the target language as best as they know how. And this is because of linguistic discrimination. And so what we're saying is, thank you, now, from the Charter on Language Policy and Language Rights in the Creole Speaking Caribbean, Articles 34 and 35, actually, the languages and cultures of all language communities should receive non-discriminatory treatment in the communications media. So they should be comfortable to, to, to use their own language in the media and to 
get information from the media in a language that they understand. Language communities are entitled to representation of their language in the communications media of their territories, specifically including the news, weather reports, public safety, and emergency messages. So very important that we look back at language policy because the public for the past 10 years in the surveys conducted by the Jamaican Language Unit in conjunction with the language planning course, we've seen where the public has expressed a positive attitude towards Jamaican Creole being used in public formal domains. So the public is actually making a demand that the language be used in these very official domains in school, in the media, in the courthouse and so on. And so it's very important that we pay attention to this so that we can find other things to laugh at. We can watch a comedy or a play to laugh and not laugh at these uh, monolingual speakers who are really just trying to cope in this particular space. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Waters? Let's see how we're going to do this, sir. Uh, for the, well, especially the Tivoli one, there's a lot, of, there's a lot going on yes. um, there. Uh, and I realized that you had missed out some of the words, especially if you're going to look right. at hypercorrection, etc. I think it might be better if you do a phonetic transcription yes. of the text, because although you represent, let's say, for example, the plural marker mm -hmm. in the Cassidy um, JLU system, a couple of times she actually produces dental fricatives and not, so even though the marker is associated with Creole, she's using a phoneme that's associated with English. And so I think even that alone will be quite interesting when you tease apart uh, yeah. Uh, you know, what the syntax is doing, what the phonology right. is doing, etc. Right, so I, I actually had that transcription, but I opted not to use it, um, trying to appeal to the non-linguists and so on, but yes. So when I actually tease it out, because it's, it's quite apparent that this is new and fresh, yes. Yes, I've heard it otherwise. I think I've heard it, I think my mind might be front, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the quick comment being, of course, that the, in one sense, the only people who are laughing are the people of the kind in here. So the, the joke is lost on the rest of the population. So that um, while the class, this tiny class of 5 or 10% are laughing their heads off, mm -hmm. the people, in fact, the, the, listen, the, the reason why I'm saying that is that I was in an actual situation when the, um, the cut across it thing. Yes. Um, I was I in rural Jamaica video. at the time and mm -hmm. having a discussion, and it turned out to my shock that nobody got the joke. Yes. And so, in the end, the joke is on people like us. Yes. We are the ones mm -hmm. who everybody is less laughing at because mm -hmm. we are the fools laughing at something that everybody else considers to be normal. So right. that's just the point. And just to, just to comment on that, Prof, I didn't have time to show a little bit of the interview that Clifton did on TVJ Neville with Simon. Neville and Simon. And he, Simon was just, not Simon, Neville, he was just laughing uncontrollably. And, and Clifton was still very serious. Yeah. He was wondering what was going on. Yes. Yes, Shalom. Yeah, so um, the first speaker from Tivoli, mm -hmm. even while she was speaking, I felt formal. Form, that's what for me, the whole way in which she produced that text yes. was formal, formal. And I think maybe what, what I was attending to was the syntax frame, frame and the bottle of her phonology. Right. Yeah, so, and maybe while I was listening, I heard Joseph's question from the prior, or statement from the prior, um, session where he was saying there's going to be a time when we might have a formal uh, Jamaican Creole. So maybe that's what I was uh, tuning into, but I know I felt mm -hmm. formal. So that was just a comment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was wondering for the second young woman when she attempted to use what you call an Americanized 
pronunciation. Mm -hmm. I was wondering again about audience. And I'm wondering about it because I'm in a discussion with a group thinking about computing technologies and how those impact people, indigenous peoples, people who don't have written or writing systems. Mm -hmm. And so we're in a technological age where it's yeah. not just being broadcast for TVJ, right. but then somebody's gonna take that, it's gonna end up on WhatsApp, it's gonna end up all over the place. So I was wondering in doing that, is she, is she doing this partially? So she switches part way. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that tr I'm, tr I'm trying to right. rationalize. Mm -hmm. So the question is why does she switch and is she targeting an audience and who is that audience? Is it just Jamaica or is it further? Yeah. Right, that's, that's something to explore as well. Thank you. I, I want to follow up on the point that I've <coughs> raised. And I'm, I'm wondering if there isn't in how we teach English in the Jamaican context. Uh, for those of us who have gone through the formal system, there's some element of performance in the teaching of English. Mm -hmm. So for Creole speakers coming into the education system, mm -hmm. when you go to a festival and choir um, and all of those kinds of things, speaking English is about performing English. And some of the inadequate um, grasping of the language mm -hmm. could then be translated into my performance compensates for that inadequate grasping. I'm not, I'm just, um, what you call it here? I'm speculating, but it's something that might need some investigation. Okay, um, well, that's something to look into, but in terms of performance too, with, with, with Jamaican, so festival time and all of that, we, we have Jamaican being performed. So both are actually performed. And just to also um, comment, so why is it that they go for that, that type of performance instead of the, the, the traditional Jamaican festival type of, of um, performance that we're used to? And just to also touch on what Shalom said about levels of formality in, in the people them are deading. I think the, 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 the pioneer then for what formal Creole can sound like is what we have now on Newstalk 93, where they are reading the news using Jamaican, one of our formal um, readers here, and it's a formal register that they've developed, but nobody's laughing, right? I think, so, and it's in, it's in pure, mesolectal, basilectal uh, creole, right? And so nobody's laughing at that, and it's formal. So I think that we, we have a model that we can use if it is that we're gonna talk about uh, formal, developing a formal register in creole, because we know that the, 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 the ideology or the thinking is that you can never be formal using patois, yeah? I think it is a very, very valid point that you've raised, and also as it relates to the competitions, the festival competitions, the performance of English is very different from the performance of Creole in that setting. And so what you see is far more like the Jamaican expressive, you know, when you're doing Creole, you have to gossip. up. <laughs> that is more Creole. Whereas the English is far more upright and it focuses on the Ds and the final NG. So it's very important and interesting to explore. Uh, afternoon, I have a question and a statement. Okay. Um, this morning I was <laughs> attacked um, by, I would consider somebody to be unadicated in, in the linguistic sphere. We were discussing um, um, Prime Minister Andrew's whole less abrupt um, statement about making Spanish second language. But um, apparently the person never get the idea that the second language that we in Jamaica experience is English. So I made a suggestion, I made a, um, what do you call it now? I put up my up suggestion that English is actually our second language and um, Jamaican Creole is our first language. The man take me on. <laughs> I said, sir, if you believe, say, um, English is your first language, then you have a right to do so. But I'm saying that the majority of Jamaicans believe mm -hmm. that 
our first language is Jamaican Creole. He said, no, English is our first, um, first language. So I said, only because you, you started talking by saying, mommy, may I have some juice or <laughs> may I have something to eat? And, and uh, uh, my question um, goes to, um, to the study that was done a few years ago. I can't remember what year exactly about um, the, with Patwa being, te um, being taught alongside English and the results were very favorable. Right. However, my question is, um, is there or has there been any update mm -hmm. as it relates to a policy within the language education system? Okay, so um, the, so you're referring to the studies that we did where we asked students, do you, asked informants, do you believe that the Jamaican, the school that teaches children in both Jamaican and English is better for the Jamaican child or just a school that teaches English. And the majority of the informants said that the bilingual school, they believe that the bilingual school is better. And then we did a follow up 10 years later and asked not only which school do you think is better, but which school would you send your picnic? Right? And again, the majority, 10 years later, said that they would actually send their child to the bilingual school. Now, in terms of the update, were you here yesterday? <laughs> so, <laughs> so Professor Devanish's uh, presentation would, would have been on that. But apart from that, we have been seeking opportunities to engage the stakeholders, particularly, particularly the Ministry of education the the point was uh, the point was about your uh, formal patois and this is a discussion I've had with dr. Lewis uh, about laughter um, you know that not all laughter is the same and sometimes you'll get laughter in response to pat even yesterday during Tally's reading um, there was laughter mm -hmm. um, but that laughter was in relation to the newness of a particular thing that they had, they had never thought about how one would say X in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And now that they hear it, it's so new and interesting that it evokes laughter. Um, and again, Dr. Lewis, they say, um, uh, this was a discussion about theater in Jamaica, where I lamented that we didn't have a lot of serious theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, his point was that uh, um, laughter for us does a range of things and incorporates uh, what would be tragedy and so on, you know, um, in other cultures. Right. And so I think too that we shouldn't classify all types of laughter because sometimes, uh, you know, people will respond um, with laughter or they, they might be amused, but it's just because of the newness of the experience right. in now hearing the thing in their own language and saying, wow, that's how I would really have said it. Or, you know, that's, that's funny. Right, but and that, thank you for making that point because that's my point, that the, the laughter that is reacting now to this negative, to what is seen as negative or some kind of ridicule or mockery of the Patwa speaker is the one that we're trying to eliminate, right? So when they hypercorrect, when they use the linguistic coping strategies, that laughter that says, what kind of foolishness that them a chat say, that is the laughter that we want to eliminate. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody. Please keep the applause going because you've been a good audience. Thank you to the presenters, Dr. Blade, Dr. Irvin Sobers, and Dr. Walters. That marks the end of this session. And uh, do I have something else to announce, Joseph? That's it. Have a good afternoon. Okay. Um, thank you. I was going to say um, thanks to Mr. Bernard, but I think he would say Bernard. <laughs> so, um, we're going to go straight into the, the showing of the documentary presented um, uh, which was prepared by Professor Ian Robertson. In March 2015, one month before her 99th birthday, Princess Sowers died at Kokwani, a mining location about 140 miles up the Burbis River in Guyana, 
in South America. Although Kokwani itself was never part of the Dutch plantation system, the location had the significance of being the world's largest producer of calcine bauxite in the latter part of the 20th century. The passing of Princess Sowers signaled that the last known speaker of Burby's Dutch had in fact died. When I discovered this Burby's Dutch language in October of 1975, there were fewer than 30 speakers of the language available at that point in time. And they were all over 50, which indicates that the language was marked for death. Some 10 years before the passing of Princess Sowers, during a field trip, which we conducted on the Burbage River with the 102-year-old Bert Alberta Bell, we came to the conclusion that she, in fact, was the last speaker. Berta herself claimed that she was the only one still alive who spoke the language. Ekali. Two weeks later, this pronouncement was repeated in the very last recording done with Alberta Bell before she died. Two months later, she was dead. Like the Creole languages found in Caribbean plantation societies, Burby's Dutch is a language formed during the earlier stages of the Burby's colony in the second quarter of the 17th century making it arguably one of the oldest Creole languages of the region. The discovery of this language signaled significant change in the understandings of the Creole languages of the Caribbean. Their makeup, their significance for historical, social, and sociopolitical understandings of this particular area of study and of what has now come to be known as contact linguistics. Burby's Dutch language provides some indication of the early experience of the Burby's colony during a period for which no historical document survived except for the 1670 work of Adrian van Berkel. Burby's Dutch is the only Creole language in the Caribbean for which a specific West African language cluster, Eastern Ijo, of the Nigerian Delta area, formed the basis of a large portion of the lexicon and grammatical features of Burmese Dutch. The Dutch inherited the forts in the Delta area in the early years of the Burbies colony. And there is at least one significant historical statement of a vessel being prepared for shipping slaves to the Burbies colony from Calabari in the 1650s. The other ship whose cargo included a large kettle, 50 pounds of tobacco, a drum and 200 pairs of shackles, all for the slaves, was to transport the remaining 500 slaves to the colony of the Zeeland family Van Peer on the Burbies River 
in what is now Guyana. Two years after the passing of Bertha Bell, further inquiry led to the discovery of the 92-year-old Princess Sowers. She was the last known speaker of this language to pass on. Her death is an appropriate signal that this language might now be declared officially dead. Princess was the last known speaker. Wanga you bante? Wanga ke bante? Uh huh. And plekin um dubuli. Dubuli, you bante dubuli. Her personal account of her biography seems to indicate that she was the most appropriate person for closure. Danga eke bante. Okay. To dubuli direct. Mm hmm. She was born at Dubuli Ranch on the Burbage River. What is now Dubele was an Amerindian settlement area, but it was also the area in which Abraham van Peer, the leader of the group of Dutch persons who settled in Babis in 1627, established his first and largest plantation on the Burbage River. Um, what you what you papa nam? What is the name? You papa, what is your name? His name was um, Henry. Mm -hmm. And, and oh, name Henry, Henry Hartman. Okay, and your mama? Christina mm -hmm. Bell. Okay. Princess's father Henny Hartman was one of the earliest speakers of Burbage Dutch recorded in the mid-1970s. Henny Hartman was a purist. He certainly objected to any intrusions of lexical items from English into Burbage Dutch. Princess, and her father in particular, lived on the Viruni Creek, the first navigable tributary on the south bank of the Burbies River, about 80 miles from the mouth. Virtually all speakers of Burbies Dutch discovered in the 1970s and onwards bear some direct link to the Wirruni Creek. The best possible explanation for this is the fact that while the 1763 rebellion led to the destruction of the plantations in the Burbies River, plantations on the Wirruni Creek remained intact. It is significant that both the fathers of Alberta Bell and Princess Sowers were in fact from the Wirruni Creek. Keke you, keke you toko. Owe ka bifi? You toko ka bifi? And then, and then, and then, and go toko. <laughs> but from Demblari, Filera de And you egg toka no coleroca? Eka toka. Not one. Not the ancel. And the name in You are the, um, you are the last ticket up. What is the beef the lunch? Well, I can glow so. I can glow so. I can sauce from. I can have a sauce from. In Chitwe, you so beefy because we name the beef the lunch. The lunch is what? Would I? A daughter, no. Just a Kalin. Okay. How fell a yari or a daughter? How fell a yari or a daughter? Three, yeah, I know, since I don't think. 
Uh-huh. Och då tar det hiri ho. Bo graf det hiri. Okej, bo graf. Men det är grandmoda. Och hur är det att det där är len, det där är len. Och sen är det en vän som är så jävla. Och det är bara att det är en vän som är så jävla. Jag är hårda. Jag är hårda. Titi efter titi. Och jag är så jävla. You need not to be free the language of it. But I never sit there and be well. You must say this, you must say this or say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But mm-hmm. only by Ori, Metashi Frindia. Since then, one of the younger brothers has passed on. And the second indicates that he has only a very passive competence of the language, although he claims to have been able to speak it when he was much younger. How fella talk up in Wahabu Danga, Tichua Yungu? How fella? How fella talk up? Uh, uh, I can't get to the... Talk up? Talk up? What you mean? Yeah, how fella? In Wahabu Musa talk up? Nine. Uh-huh. Nice. You're the HT? Oh, don't, don't. Yeah, you're the, the third. Ah, you're the third. third. Okay. Mm-hmm. We're the HT. Princess? Princess. And after Princess? No, sorry, sorry. You had Frederick. Uh-huh. Frederick. Mm-hmm. Princess. Winifred. Uh-huh. Sylvinas. Mm-hmm. Fayola. Fay. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That report. Mm-hmm. You know the say she. Say she. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. None of her grandchildren speak the language. And with her passing, knowledge of the language in her community is obviously going to disappear. The gradual movement towards the extinction of the Burmese Dutch language is probably readily paralleled by the gradual deterioration in the health of Princess Sowers. The initial recording done with Princess Sowers two years after the passing of Alberta Bell shows her in full control, both physically and mentally, except perhaps, as she confesses, for a slight difficulty with hearing. Just like a mother tongue, I can walk to everyone, just quick as a gnome. Mm-hmm. I can say, I can come to the tongue. Mm-hmm. After I can come to the tongue, I can tell them. I want to know, and just take it in the auto. Mm. I can, anyway, mm-hmm. I can, I can went the well. I can move the water. I can cope with the garlic. The garlic, not to let it be in the palm, I can rent that the south. Drag your book, match the south. I can free for the boy. Mm-hmm. And let purify life that. Oh boy. Oh, the Robinson. Oh, the water. I can put that in that tongue. I can cook that coso. I can cook that love of coso. And although her son did not speak the language, she certainly used it in his presence and he seemed to find it amusing. One year after the initial recording with Princess Sowers, her health began to deteriorate. Her ability to use the language, though not affected at the level of her production certainly was impaired 
by some of her physical limitations. Two subsequent interviews with Princess Sowers continued to document the disappearance or the fear of own failing health, which led eventually to her final demise in 2015. In March of 2015, Princess Sowers had her final handshake with the language that remained undocumented for more than 300 years and which provided significant social, historical, and linguistic evidence of life in the Burbies colony under the Dutch. have raised the same um, sort of issue for languages that if the speakers want the language to die um, who are we um, to want it to live on so should we keep it on life support when the speakers have determined that it is time for it to go and they, they signal that in very different ways now of course as linguists we you know we're interested in the culture we're interested in the language uh, what it offers to uh, to us in terms of linguistic diversity, etc. But there's also the the other human side that languages are spoken, you know, are social um, things, and they're spoken by people, and those people have views about, um, you know, what the languages should do, etc. I mean that goes into the whole Creole thing, and you know, should you convince people against their own you know, um, beliefs that their language should, you know, be used in X domains, etc. Um, so it opens up um, a can of worms, uh, essentially. Uh, so one other comment. Uh, Professor Devon, is saying it's true, and I believe it is, then in relation to what you just said a while ago, conditions will change, right? So communities will change, and there might indeed be a change such that a community thinks that they have all lived this particular language, mm -hmm. right? You know, is, is, is there any way we as a, 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 you know, a body of linguists could acknowledge that this community, it appears as if the younger persons are not interested in learning the language, the older persons aren't interested in passing on the language, and it is clear that this language is about to die. Mm -hmm. and we have a finite set of resources. We can do one of two things. We can channel resources into revitalizing the language, which results in artificial longevity, or we decide that we're going to preserve the language at, at least, you know, at, at, as a first um, attempt at ensuring that something from the language survives. You know, that is one of the things I asked uh, Godfrey Steele when he did this presentation on language death in, in Trinidad. And his response was that both can happen simultaneously. Yeah. And, and even the way we record these days and, and preserve, uh, uh, there are some cultures that um, are not in favor of uh, electronic recording. And then because you're trapping the spirit of the person, uh, preventing them from, you know, moving on to the next plane. You know, so, you know, linguists have to, to contend with these sort of things and how how do we do the work that we um, that we have to do, um, but still be respectful to the to the people, um, their culture, and their wishes about their um, their languages? Yeah, just a, just a comment on to kind of relate it to the the human rights issue. Um, I know there is a there is a there was a there's a judge on the um, Inter American Court who has tried to suggest that uprootedness 
is a human rights issue because uprootedness is one of the reasons why, for example, you have people coming into urban centers and they're dislocated and the urban centers and you start getting slums, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, it might, in, it might m make sense for the state to try to create the conditions for groups in places that are remote and therefore with resources they would stay to do so mm -hmm. instead of having everybody flooding into an urban center and trying to, um, as, as Hubert called it, homogenize and everybody. Okay, um, so thanks very much. And once again, thanks um, to Professor Robertson. Uh, what's the plan for the, the video? <laughs> Minus pilot, you know. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so um, thanks again. We are going to, because the next session is two hours, we are going to take um, the, the two minute break here and then get right into the next session, which we'll do and then move right into the plenary.